Good morning from Fresh Start. What a blessing it is to be back in the house of the Lord. Uh, we're here this morning on our uh, Matthew study. We're in chapter number two. Uh, we're going to pick it up this morning about verse 13. And uh, so while you are turning this morning uh, to Matthew chapter two, we'll ask Father for his blessings. Precious Father, we come to you thanking you for another blessed day. We ask Father for you, you'd open eyes and open ears to your word, Father. Allow your word to land on fertile ground. And Father, we'll give you the praise and give you the glory for all things. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13. And <clears throat> as we recap just a little, uh, we've seen that the, uh, that the wise men had came and uh, considered where was this king of the Jews uh, that uh, was in the same land of Herod. And Herod was uh, kindly concerned about this. It, uh, it uh, made him uh, a little bit uh, concerned. And, and so we pick up here in chapter 2 in verse number 13, and it reads, And when they, they being the uh, wise men, when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take thy young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek to the young child to destroy him. And that was on his mind. You see, father is a cardio knower. Uh, not only uh, just those that are saved, but father knows the thoughts of all men. Verse 14, And when he, being Joseph, when he arose, uh, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt. Father has a way of protection that he brought to the Christ child, and he sent him into Egypt. Now, it doesn't say this, but I would like to uh, bring out that in Egypt, in this wilderness uh, where God would speak to him and take care of him is the same concept that you and I will experience in this near future. Uh, that how Father will draw us, uh, Revelation chapter 12, uh, into the wilderness. And uh, there he will provide for you and I and give for us the hidden manna, which is the word of God, that will uh, sustain us and will keep us until uh, the coming of our Savior. And so Father has a plan. And it's a wonderful plan. It's a plan uh, that man cannot uh, mess up. And it's a plan that is perfect. Verse 15. And was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, uh, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And uh, this is in Hosea 11 and 1. And that's what he said. He said that, uh, well, let me read that. Uh, Hosea 11 and 1. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And that's exactly the same concept that like I had spoken about how that father will take care of his children in that day, not only uh, in the day that we are looking for, but also in the time of the day of Christ. When Christ was unable to protect himself, father had a protection over him, kind of like you and I. When we're unable to protect ourselves, uh, father steps in and makes a way. He makes a way that no man can hinder, no man can uh, mistakenly uh, say that it was their work, it was Father. And Father is good that way. He's loving and he cares. He knows the minds of the evil. He knows exactly what their motivation is and what their next move is going to be. Therefore, Father will protect you and I. It's something to be said that to serve the living God. 
God is a God that cares. He's a God that loves and a God that protects. And as long as we are doing what Father has asked us to do, provisions come your way in small ways and in enormous ways. Father is good, and he provides uh, however he has need of. And Father's very much concerned about his children. Verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children uh, that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So we're speaking about a, a two-year process uh, from when uh, Christ was born until he had spoken to the wise men. And to cover all of his tracks, Herod thought, well, the way that I'll take and uh, deal with this is to uh, just slay all of the male uh, children uh, in the coast of Bethlehem, in, in the area of Judea. And that's what he done. Verse 17, Then was fulfilled... That which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, 18, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentations and weeping, and a great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. Now, as horrible as this would seem, Father has a plan. The plan, turn with me to Jeremiah 31. In Jeremiah 31, we're going to read verse 15 and 16. Jeremiah 31, 15, it reads, Thus saith the Lord, A voice was heard in Ramah, Lamentations and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. And this is what Rachel named her last son, Benani. And the father changed his name to Benjamin. And we see that she was in labor, and of course we know that Rachel passed while having Benjamin. But verse 16, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and thy eyes from tears. In other words, don't cry, don't worry. For thy works shall be rewarded. The works that she had done and for bringing forth Judah and Benjamin, these two will be reunited and brought back into the 12 uh, tribe comprised of the 12 uh, tribes in Ezekiel chapter 37. It talks about in the days of the first day of the millennium uh, that they will be brought back together, that with Israel, the ten tribes. In, in other words, the, uh, uh, they write their name upon the stick, and the two sticks become one. That's what the scriptures read. But it also says, For thy work thou shalt be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. I want to give a little bit of comforting thought this morning to those that are listening that in Revelations chapter 19 and verse number 14, Christ has come back. The seventh trump has sounded. Chapter 19 and verse 14. And <clears throat> I'll start reading about verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. He makes war to his enemies. Verse 12, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. 
and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the reason why his clothes was dipped in blood was uh, because of the uh, work that he had to do in the wine press. In other words, the Bible talks about how that the blood will flow through the streets to the height of a horse's bridle. Spiritually speaking, he's speaking in a spiritual term that how the dead of the world, there is so many, and that when he does put them where they belong, uh, that, well, spiritually it would be to that elevation. But verse 14 is why I came. And the armies uh, which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. These, I believe, are the children that were taken in the slewing of Herod in that day. They all were males. They all were under two. Therefore, being uh, under the age of accountability, they were spotless. Therefore, it put them in a position uh, to be with God. You say, well, now, those are just children. When you are in glory, when you are with Christ, uh, you are as the angelics. You are as a young person, uh, a young male, a young female, for say. But a young male is what we're speaking about. And these here will come at that time. Back in Matthew Chapter 2 and verse 19. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. 20, saying, Arise and take thy young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. Now that should be enough to uh, give confidence to Joseph to know that he can march right on through and have no problem. Verse 21, And he arose, being Joseph, and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. 22, But when he had heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. This was prophetic. Although it may have turned to the mind of Joseph, and he was worried, not to say that he disputed the word of God, but he concerned, verse 23, And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. I want to say this morning, unlike many have brought out, I want to bring out this morning that Christ was not a Nazarite. Neither was Christ born in Nazareth. Although he went to Nazareth, it being there in that citizenship made him a Nazarene. Now, a Nazarite has a course that one should take. Let's just see if it matches to what Christ did. Judges chapter 13 gives us a great illustration of a Nazarite. And we're speaking here this morning of Samson. Samson was a Nazarite. He was a judge uh, during the days of uh, Israel. And uh, you know the story. It goes on to say that... Uh, uh, and the child of Israel did evil against the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years, too. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Dainties, uh, whose name was Mona. 
Maona, <clears throat> and his wife was barren and bare not. She didn't have any children at the time. Three, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. For now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. Five, for lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. <clears throat> for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now, this Nazarite has a course that he is supposed to take. If you'll turn with me over to Numbers chapter number 6, we'll define this this morning. In Numbers chapter 6, And verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, To speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. 3. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall not drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liqueur of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. For in all the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. Five. In the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days he be fulfilled. In thee which he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall be holy and shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. Six, all the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. I read all of that in your hearing this morning for you to decipher in your own mind. Was Christ a Nazarite? My answer is no. Meaning that the first miracle that Christ had performed, he turned, well, the water into wine. And many times they proclaimed and accused our Lord and Savior of being with the publicans and the sinners and also being a wine-bibber. For one to be a wine-bibber means you must partake in the wine. Now, we know that Christ, when he done the Last Supper, that he used wine being represented at his blood. Now, there's nothing wrong with fermented wine. It's very natural. It's a natural thing. It happens. But the reason why that I say that Christ was not a Nazarite is that also in John chapter 11 that he came and he uh, on the fourth day, not the third, but the fourth day, he brought Lazarus, Eleazar in the Hebrew, meaning the uh, priesthood, he brought him back to life. You say, well, now, uh, I believe he was just sleeping. Well, the scriptures don't teach that. The scriptures say in John chapter 11, start reading about verse 7. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. Eight, and his disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, There are there not twelve hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. 
10, but if a man walketh in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. Verse 11, these things said he, after that he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. 12, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleepeth, he shall do well. 13, how be it Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of a rest in his sleep. Verse 14 is why I came. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So we know that if he had made this vow of a Nazarite, he would in no wise be able to come around a dead body, nor would he have been able to partake in any of the vine uh, that was spoken of, nor his hair being cut. Uh, and But yet again, there is nothing in the word of God that proclaims that Christ was a Nazarite. So we're going to leave it at that this morning. Chapter number three in the book of Matthew in verse number one, and it reads, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, two, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist, he came in the spirit of, of Elijah. And we have recording of this in Malachi chapter number four. Malachi chapter four and verse number one. Finally, okay, Malachi chapter 4 and verse number 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them, saith the Lord of hosts, uh, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now, of course, this is after the millennial. This is after uh, uh, the teaching and the discipline. Verse 2. But unto you that revere my name uh, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. Verse 3. And ye shall tread down wicked, the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the sole of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. For... Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto ye him in Herob for all of Israel with the, status, uh, uh, with the statutes and judgments. Verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And verse number 6. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, uh, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, we see here that uh, John the Baptist, when he came, he did not come as Elijah. He came in the spirit of Elijah. What was he preaching? Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here. So back in Matthew chapter 3, and verse number three. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, uh, make his path straight. And this is mentioned in Isaiah uh, chapter 40 in verse three and four. Verse number four. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a Leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Uh, the food and the clothing. It's spoken of there. The food is about a prophet uh, in Leviticus chapter 11. Uh, that where they are to, well, they would be fed uh, 
that of the wild, the locusts, and the honey. Verse number 5. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. 6. And were baptized of him in Jordan, uh, confessing their sins. And uh, that is exactly what one does. They confess their sins. They come to Christ as their personal Savior, knowing in their minds that they have need of a Savior. And the next thing that follows is baptism. Six. And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Seven. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees uh, come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned ye to flee from the wrath to come. <coughs> He's calling them the offspring of the serpent, that which was in the garden, that which brought forth Cain, the first murderer, that which brought forth the Kenites. We know that John understood exactly who these Pharisees and Sadducees were. And he says here, of who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Question. Eight. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. Eight. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able to, of these stones, to raise up children unto Abraham. And it's not enough and that just to be a child of Abraham. But we know that Abraham was the father of many nations. We know that Abraham was the father of all of the world. But we see here that he's saying just because of uh, uh, you being in the lintage of Abraham, that doesn't make it right. Verse 10, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And we read that in John chapter 15, that where we read that where God is the husbandman and Christ, <clears throat> he speaks there in, let me, let me take you over there to John chapter 15. I want to read that. There's one scripture here that I'd like to bring out. John chapter 15, verse 1 is, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Who takes it away? God does. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. There's something to be said about being purged. There's something to be said about Father correcting you and I. We had made mention there a couple of sermons back how that we all have come to the point in our life where we have been corrected by God. And it's been said that we are to turn and kiss the paddle, thanking God for correcting us and making us fit for the kingdom of heaven. Verse 3, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. And no more can ye except ye abide in me. 5, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, and without me you can do nothing. Six, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So we see here that's what John was speaking of. That of the separation in that time. Back in John, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. 
But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. This fire that he speaks about. It can be two things. It can be either a consuming fire, which is done by God, or it can be a warming by the Holy Spirit. Is that what you and I have experienced? That when the Holy Spirit comes and brings truth to our minds and understanding, there is a warming over you and I. And that's what it means to be a child of the King. He said, He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Verse 12, Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat in the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This where Christ will do the separation. We have read, you have read there in the book of Ruth, where Boaz had went to the threshing floor, and he winneth. To winneth means that to do a separation of that which is heavy and that which is light, meaning the chaff, which is in the grain as you toss it up. Uh, Boaz, he done it in the evening when the winds were up and uh, the sun was going down, and he would toss it, and the chaff would fly away, and all that would fall would be pure grain. And that's exactly how Christ will do. It says here in verse 12 again, whose fan is in his, right, in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. He will clean it. He'll make sure that there is none that defile. And gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. And that will be the separation. God does not desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It does, Father, no glory in that to do away with any of his children. You see, Father created you and I. He created all man. And it hurts Father to have to destroy one of his children. But when it comes to his law, and it comes to the effectiveness that it does to the others, that which uh, is said that uh, one bad apple ruins the whole bunch, that is true. It can. It very well can. And therefore, God knows that there needs to be a separation, a complete separation in that day. This day that you are living in, we are still amongst one another, aren't we? We're still amongst one another, and we have to deal with the evil, and we do our best to try to find uh, that which is good, to uh, cleave to it. And therefore, we know that God is still on the throne. Verse 13 says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Christ is coming to set the standard for you and I, the need for this baptism. Verse 14, And John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Question <clears throat> 15, And Jesus answering said unto him, <clears throat> Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. He allowed him to do these things. John felt very insignificant at the time. I can imagine why. He said to himself, I don't even have right to even touch your shoes, Lord. But yet you want me to baptize you. Now remember, this is at the beginning of, of his ministry. And so... As we read, let me go on down, verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. 
and he saw the Spirit of God, meaning the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and lighting upon him. So at this time is when Christ received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had come upon him at that time, and he was endowed with it at that very moment. I said all that to say this, that when you get saved, when you put up the white flag and surrender to the Lord, and you say to yourself, I want to be a Christ man. I want to be a Christ woman. I want to do what God would have me to do. You set your mind and your course forward to doing the right thing. Just as what Christ has done. As he came up, the Bible says here that the Holy Spirit uh, descended on him uh, like a dove. Beautiful. In 1 Corinthians 5 and 17 said, If any man be in Christ Jesus, all things have been made new. Behold, all, things, uh, all old things have gone away. Meaning that you have become a new creature. You have become new and there are new things in your life. But, remember this, verse 17, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is God speaking. He said, I love him, and that he had done these things, and now his ministry will begin. Let us move on into chapter number 4. This is the reason why I came and said that when you are Saved by the grace of God, when you truly uh, come to Him in repentance and you follow up with water baptism, showing that you honor what Christ had done for you and I, the liquid grave sown in weakness and raised in power, is this a criteria that we have to do? It's not meant that you have to do it, but it shows honor unto God. It shows God that you honor what Christ had done on the cross. Now you say, well, uh, the thief on the cross, he wasn't baptized. That's exactly right. And that day when he was slain, when he was dead, he entered into the kingdom with Christ. But verse number one in chapter four Christ gives us an example of what's going to befall the children. And it's so important that when one is saved under your watch care, say you're a church and you uh, uh, seen someone that uh, repented and was saved by the grace of God, you should take them under your wing. And hold them closely. Not to send them out into the world where uh, the Bible says that many are uh, as uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. To be devoured. It is a time when you are to rear them up and to teach them uh, the profane and the holy. The difference between the two. It's a time when you are to take and work with this individual to bring them up to where they can stand on their own. They're very vulnerable. So verse number one, it says that, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. This is the very first thing that happened to Christ after his baptism, after he had taken on the Holy Spirit. Now, this where Christ was led up into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. This is an example for you and I. Verse number 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And I can imagine. Uh, it's, not, it's not said that um, individuals should fast to that point. It's not wise to fast for 40 days. Uh, there are many people that uh, have uh, disabilities today and uh, uh, say a, a diabetic, for instance, uh, someone who cannot uh, sustain from having foods 
or having anything of that nature. Now, fasting doesn't necessarily mean of food. You can fast from anything. You can fast from, uh, uh, from going and coming. You can fast from uh, watching uh, the, the television, per se, or uh, the, the uh, being uh, uh, one that uh, is on the phone. Uh, you can fast from a lot of different things. But what Christ done here, he fasted and was tempted of the devil. Verse number three. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, granted, we know that Satan knew exactly who he was talking to. He knew that he was the Son of God. Why do we know that? Because that's what Satan always wanted to be. That's why Satan is the son of perdition today. Because he tried to take over the throne of God, wanting to be the son of God, wanting the position that Christ had. Therefore, it was nonsense for him to even bring this up and to try to dispute the word with Christ. Again, verse number 3, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones that to be made bread. And he came at Christ's weakest point in his life, thinking that he would be able to uh, overshadow him in his thoughts. Very important for you to be aware of. Very important for a, a child of God, a student of the Word of God, to be very aware that when you are vulnerable, Satan is going to come. The tempter will be at your door when you are vulnerable. Verse number four. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This is Deuteronomy chapter eight and verse number three. This is how... You sustain yourself and resist the devil with the word of God, with God's promises. Verse number five. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, in other words, into Jerusalem, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Kindly ironic how he brought him into Jerusalem where Satan is going to set his own seat. Knowing that he is an abominator and he is going to make the place an abomination where he set it and what he speaks. We know that Satan is a liar and he loves to try to toy with people. Verse number six. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. In Psalms 91, In the 91st Psalm, we have this what Satan is quoting. Now, granted, remember, he loves to twist the words. It reads in the 91st Psalm, verse 11, For he shall give his angel charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. 12. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. So Jesus replies, back in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. A lot of this happens through ignorance. Father has given us 
minds and understanding and given us an opportunity to think on our own. Now, when one takes and handles a viper, a venomous snake, and you handle this snake, this, uh, <laughs> this snake hasn't read the Word of God. It doesn't know that it shouldn't bite you. But I'm here to tell you this morning that uh, if you handle one of those things and uh, you, you handle it long enough, you're going to more than likely get bitten. And it has happened before. Uh, these that were trying to proclaim uh, uh, the power of God, thinking that they have power with the Lord. We do have power. We have power to put Satan where he belongs. That's the power that we have. But to tempt the Lord thy God is not a very smart thing. So back in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and sheweth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. In other words, uh, the glory of it's like the one worldism. It's all taking part in the kingdom today. Verse 9. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. That's exactly what he wants. Remember, that is what is required of an individual in this next future to honor uh, the Antichrist. When you fall down and you worship him, as told up in uh, uh, Daniel chapter 8, we are not to worship him in what manner, form, fashion of any sort. We are not to give him any type of obedience other than to listen to what he has to say. We are not to worship him in any way whatsoever. And then he says here again in verse 9, And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, uh, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Verse 10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence. In other words, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. We, as children of God, accepting Christ as our personal Savior, we have this same power. You can order Satan out of your home, out of your life, out of your workplace. You can rule him however you see fit to put him where he belongs. Through anointing your home and anointing yourself. There are many today that wrestle with a lot of problems and they assume that because a loved one brings this into my home or a loved one is in this situation that I should tolerate it. You don't have to tolerate that anything of the devil. You have no need to tolerate anything that of Satan. What that does is brings you down and separates you from God. You have power. You have the power to put him where he belongs. In this day, that's what we pray, that he is set outside this building as we study and we teach the word of God that there be no hindrance. It's very important that you practice this and do it in a fashion that exhorts the Lord and it belittles uh, Satan where he belongs. So again, in verse number 10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only uh, shalt thou serve. Verse 11, Then the devil leaveth him. Did you see that? Didn't give him any place to ride. <clears throat> 
been said many a time, boy, the, the devil's been on my back all week long. I, I just don't know what I'm going to do. Well, don't give him a saddle to ride on. Don't give him a place to ride. Put him where he belongs. Get that thing out of your life before it festers up. So it says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Satan was the first one that Christ ministered to. And it's so important, as we see here in verse 11, that the angels came and ministered unto him. In other words, they, they took care of him. They, they fed him. That's what you need. That's what we all need. We need to be fed, not of bread and water, but Amos 8 and 11, of the hearing of the true word of God. That's what we have need of today. Have no need to worry about what type of foods we're going to eat that day or uh, worry whether or not we're going to have. All these things are sufficient for your day. What's important for you is, is that to learn the word of God, and to study it and be fluent with it, as fluent as you possibly can. Now, granted, I know there's some that uh, may have a disability, a, a learning disability, or uh, unable to uh, properly read or uh, uh, retain what they read for say, and, and I understand that. But I'm saying this morning it's important that you follow along and listen uh, to what the Word of God has to say. It's very important. It will help you. It will sustain you. All right, we're going to close right there on verse 11. We'll pick back up in verse number 12 in chapter 4. The book of Matthew is a very, very interesting book, and it teaches you and I from the beginning all the way to the end. What we are to do and how that we are to uh, carry ourselves and uh, what we are to uh, expect from God. God loves you and he cares for you. We appreciate you here at the Fresh Start. We thank you so much for your prayers and uh, we continue to pray for you. Uh, although we have never met, I still can lift you up and pray for you. We see that we have viewers throughout and Many people uh, enjoy listening, and uh, it's through the gift that God has given. It's not me, but it's the gift that God has given in that to teach the Word of God, how it ought to be, line upon line and precept upon precept, so that the student will have all that he has need of, that you go away not wanting, that you are complete in all your studies. And then again, we appreciate you. Thank you again for being part of our Bible study this morning. Until the next time, may the Lord richly bless.